the DEA decided to crack down on all pot smokers and forced everyone to take a piss test. Enforcing this law would require building prison walls around almost every city in America. I just uh, see such a corollary between uh, the war on drugs and uh, prohibition of alcohol. Uh, we tried the prohibition of alcohol, and I don't think anybody in this country wants to return to that. And yet alcohol is unbelievably uh, destructive uh, for a small percentage of people who, who imbibe. Prohibition was an attempt by ideologues, similar to the ideologues that we have today, to impose their moral values on the rest of the country. And what they discovered was that it creates crime waves. My name is T. Rogers. I am the CEO of Sidewalk University and the founder of SELF, Survival Education for Life and Family. I also help start the Bloods on the West Coast. No camera, you don't want no camera. No camera time. Blood used to mean my brother. Exactly. Yeah, from the Vietnam War. Being a drug dealer doesn't mean that you are a gang member. And being a gang member doesn't mean that you're a drug dealer. But the war on drugs in itself, in essence, it it it, it gives you the power to sell drugs in a particular neighborhood. Drugs come from poverty, which inspires crime, which inspires a loss of confidence, a loss of pride. Instead of war on poverty, you've got a war on drugs, so the police can bother me. The administration had a war on poverty, and that seemed to dissipate. It seemed to disappear at all. I, I mean, it just, it was gone. And then all of a sudden, up popped this thing called war on drugs. After getting out of the mental hospital, my brother was moved to a halfway house, deep in the ghetto. Here Kurt was introduced to crack cocaine. The people running the halfway house drove Kurt to the pawn shop where he pawned his guitars worth over $2,000 and trade for $100 worth of crack. I was always told that crack was a black man's drug, but now my own brother was hooked. Drug prohibition for cocaine was basically passed in order to protect white women from black males. And, and the, the history will document this. Talking to people in the ghetto, one dealer's name always came up when talking about crack's popularity. Freeway Ricky Ross became known as the Walmart of crack. Ricky's story has become as legendary as Tony Montana and Scarface, but with an even more bizarre twist. Ricky, who is currently serving time in the Texarkana Federal Prison, is scheduled for release in 2013. The prison denied me access with a camera, so I started interviewing Ricky over the prison pay phone. You know, a lot of people don't know what it's like to, to, to come in, uh, uh, in the house and there's nothing to eat. You know, to go to a supermarket and, and, and walk through the store and, and eat out of the cookies and, and, and things of that nature just to have something to eat. Cocaine came along, you know, and gave me a new horizon, <laughs> I would say. There's a new epidemic. Smokable cocaine, otherwise known as crack. I remember clearly one day in the late 80s, every single news network simultaneously running an identical news alert about the new incredible, powerful, unbelievably cheap drug that was to sweep the nation. This is crack cocaine. Soon, every single black person living in the ghetto would sell his own mother for another hit of crack cocaine. It was like watching a strategically engineered ad campaign. Talk about perfect product placement. Did we mention it's cheap and strong and very addictive? It's only $5 now, so stay away from it. Let there be no mistake. This stuff is poison. Crack cocaine epidemic. Crack, 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 crack cocaine epidemic. Few street level dealers have ever reached the legendary status of Freeway Rick with distribution that rivaled many Fortune 500 companies. Freeway Ricky Ross was a young, aggressive, savvy, streetwise marketer. 
uh, who started selling cocaine, and then suddenly some major sources opened up for him. At the height of Rick's operation, he had over 40 full-time employees in Los Angeles alone. He had cook houses, cash counting houses, rock houses, decoy houses, and even a house he lived in. Cooking was always our most vulnerable and our most time-consuming uh, uh, thing to do. Usually you could put it in uh, like a big Samsonite suitcase. You could put 100 keys just about in one of those, or maybe two of them. So that's what, that's, that's what we normally cook every night, like 100 kilos. Rick shares some good down-home cooking tips about rocking it up. Well, the way we did it is I, I basically was a chef. You know, I, I did all the stirring. I would tell the guys who to mix. Like one guy, he would be standing there, and I would tell him, add more baking soda, uh, pour more water, you know, that type of situation. So it was more, yeah, it was like an assembly line. I know this is nothing to joke about, but Rick is your all-American opportunist. And as the media told us, crack was now the big new opportunity. You know, we had houses where you basically would uh, go up to the window and, and it would be served right out the window, kind of like the way McDonald's does it, I guess. Because we had uh, houses in so many different locations. Basically, you know, I wanted a location. I wanted it to be convenient for the, for the people, you know, where they wouldn't have to drive for. It was kind of like marketing, I guess you would say. The gangs evolved, and the gangs were a great business venture. They're basically marketing tools. That's that's really what they were, uh, and they were quietly promoted behind the scenes. They got a lot of money, uh, they got a lot of power. They fought for drug turf. Everyone's working for somebody else right now, legally or illegally. One Thanksgiving, my brother came home from a halfway house. My aunts, my uncles, my young rich cousins were all there. No one could have been prepared for the moment Kurt pulled out a crack pipe at the dinner table and started smoking rock during the pre-meal prayer. There's a thing called a bell. You get your bell rung. That's when you, when, you, when you hit the pipe and you hold it. And you hold it for so long that something inside of your head, it rings. After the first hit, you go on a that's the highest you're gonna really get. That is the highest you're going to get. Uh, they call it ringing the bell? Is that somebody else in there? <laughs> that? After that, you have a, 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 an increased appetite for cocaine. And you want more, and you want more, and you want more. And you tell yourself, I'll just take $10 or $5 and buy me a little hit to sustain myself, to hold myself off. But after you get that little hit, you want more, and you want more, and you want more. Then that's called chasing the rock. Drugs can obviously cause horrible addictions, but the drug war creates black markets, creating an even more dangerous addiction for money. Well, I became addicted to the money and also the power too, I believe. You know, to be in charge and to have people look up to you and talk highly of you. Big names like Freeway, Rick, going down. People actually want to be like him because they, they don't think about drugs, they just think about the money. But what about those people whose lives are still affected by the Los Angeles crack epidemic? Someone that wants to get in a program, someone that wants to get away from this lifestyle, easily can do it. What you know, what easily can do it. I mean, if, 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 they can, if they can just overcome the addiction. Many people in Washington will tell you that the crack epidemic ended in the late 90s. But according to Sergeant Lou Daigle of the Los Angeles Police Department, crack sales are stronger than ever. Um, basically on San Julian, you can come and everyone's selling Everyone will either either be a, act as a hook for you and, and bring you to a uh, to a buyer. Um, a lot of the a lot of the buys go on intense. Um, we've even had intelligence that you know gangsters will come, gangbangers will. I mean, basically every gangbanger comes down here to make money. Right. Okay. They come down from the inner city. They come down from East LA. They come down from everywhere. All the different rival gangs, and very rarely actually is there a shooting. Uh, between gang members. Although Freeway Rick remains locked up, many people still blame him for Crack's easy availability. One time, uh, I went over to this lady's house to drop her off some drugs, and it was the look that the little boy had in his eyes, you know, as if, man, you're taking food out of our refrigerator. You know, we're not going to have anything to eat. And I thought about it, and I said, man, I was putting him in the same position that I was running from. You know, I basically was running from poverty. That's basically how I got tied up in, in, in the drug business, because I never wanted to be a drug dealer, you know, when I was growing up. At one time, I even wanted to be a police officer or a firefighter. 